Well, this is uh, Worship Sunday, uh, and then we're going to take communion after the message here. If you want your kids to be able to stay in and join you in that, that's great. Um, there's still time for them to catch up with kids' ministry if they want to do something different. Uh, but we're continuing on in the series in James, and I want to take a, a brief look kind of um, off of one of the, the verses we covered last week. And so James chapter 3, if you'll follow along with me. James chapter 3, if you remember, the whole book is a wisdom book, uh, and it's about deeds and, and not just hearing the word, but doing the word. And, and James is going to move into this period of talking about wisdom, but he really wants to deal with the tongue first, um, because the tongue really kind of directs us one way or the other. It's the, the rudder that turns the ship, if you will. And in talking about the tongue in, in James 3, he ends up saying this thing in verse 9. So James chapter 3, verse 9. It says, with the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in God's likeness. And out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. So... James is just trying to say, hey, listen, the, we understand the logic of this, that, that something that's unified can't be separated into two. If you walk out to the Deschutes River, you can't separate it out and say, well, here's the salt water component of the Deschutes River. Here's the fresh water component of the Deschutes River. Like that's, that's a category fallacy. It's a false dichotomy. It just doesn't work. You can't go into the middle of the ocean and say that little piece right over there is, looks like it could be fresh water but everything else in the Atlantic is salt water. I mean, that would be absurd to say that when, you, when you're really dealing with a body of water, it's mixed together, whether it's fresh or whether it's salt water, it's mixed together. It can't really be separated into two component parts. And, and James is saying, you understand this. It's so common that even children would understand that. They would get that. They'd be able to talk about that. Um, it's, it's organic. It's holistic. And here's the deal. It seems like it's always easy to praise God. It's always easy to sing worship songs. It's always easy to utter prayers, asking God for, for help or assistance, or even giving him the glory that he's big, that he's majestic, that he created um, the stars, and the moon, the heavens, the, the beauty that we see around us, that, that it's easy to kind of flow into that. But James is saying there's this other tendency that we have as people, and that's to disparage our fellow man, our brothers and our sisters, and that we can too easily see these things as being disconnected, um, and we, we insert a false dichotomy into that. The justice stuff that we do at, at, at Antioch Kilns College, um, the justice conference, which was really about... Um, creating a conversation on a theology of justice. And so when people talk to us about that, like what, what was different about that? Why did it, why did it succeed? What, what really made it work? I kind of laugh and I'm like, you know, we all think theology is boring. The, the word theology is boring, but that's really what the Justice Conference was doing, was creating a conversation about how God, uh, when we study God, we end up learning about justice. When we study justice, we end up um, learning about God, that these two things are inseparable, that the justice is rooted in the character of God, it flows from the heart of God, and that when we're going to study this thing, we have to first study God and let that influence our actions. That we're not just caught up in causes or whatever, whatever the latest fad is or whatever it might be, but this is really a theological thing. So the Justice Conference is really about a theology of justice. Um, and that's what we try to do in kind of all of our discussions about this. And when, when, I, when I really talk about that, one of the first things I have to tackle is that we have always had, the people of God have, have always had this tendency to break the first command from the second command. That love of God is different than or more important than or separate from love of neighbor. And, and that they operate independently. And I think this has always been the error that God's people have found, that when God sent prophets, the prophet Isaiah and others, it was always to tell them, how can you say you're doing this if you're not doing this? Don't you see the logical connection that if you're loving God, that means you're loving the things of God. You're loving the children of God. You're loving the creation of God. You can't pay lip service to God 
um, while also disparaging the things of God and think that you're not disparaging God himself. That this is a, a holistic thing, that these things go together, that there's no dichotomy here, that love of God implies love of neighbor. And that love of neighbor oftentimes lead to a, leads to a greater devotion of God, that these things are connected. And that's really what James is dealing with here. He's saying we can't pay lip service to God, we can't praise God and, and then turn around and think that fresh water's here and salt water's here. It has to be unified. Um, and we forget that. I think we forgot it back in the Old Testament. I think the Pharisees forgot this. And that's why Jesus was trying to say, don't you understand that love of neighbor goes all the way out to strangers and foreigners and even enemies that you would pray for and believe in and hope that someday those enemies would become friends. I mean, that's crazy. And sometimes in all of our Bible reading and Bible passion, we forget that. We used to have um, this stress ball at Antioch. Some of you might have been around long enough to remember this, but we, we used to have more time on our hands. Um, and and we, we thought one day, like, wouldn't it be funny if this yellow stress ball, we put the verse, um, love your enemies on it. You know, the, the whole idea is like you're stressed and the verse is like, love your enemies. Anybody? Sick. Um, it was Kip's idea. Um, <laughs> anyways, like, so the stress ball and it said, love your enemies. And we thought it was kind of a cute thing. And we used to put those in the welcome bags that we had. And one Sunday, particular Sunday, a family came to church um, and, and it didn't go well. It didn't go well in the kids' ministry, um, didn't go well, whatever. And, and so we got kind of this comment like that the kid was upset arguing with the teacher about something. And, and I, I kind of went to one of the pastors and I'm like, hey, can you follow up on this? Um, I just want to, you know, we want to make sure that we're, we're loving these people. And, and can you follow up on this? So this particular pastor called the family, got the dad, and the dad really started laying into him. You know, we came because we thought this was a Bible-believing church. And, you know, and blah, 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 and starts kind of railing into him and this and that and the other. And then the dad um, goes, and then we got in the car and my son pulls out this little stress ball out of the welcome bag. And it, and it says, love your enemies. Like, how ludicrous. That's not in scripture. And, and it, was the, it was like the funniest thing. It's that sometimes the most adamant, Bible-believing Pharisees just miss the obvious that the love passages in scripture extend beyond our comfort zones. And we read with blinders. And so we see Isaiah and then Jesus saying, man, sometimes we can preach and we can talk and we can teach and we can coach. But it's as if people don't hear what we're saying. They don't see it. They don't grasp it. Um, and, it and it was kind of like we just let that family go. And just was like, wow, we're not going to win there. But the idea is Jesus is trying to teach the Pharisees, like, hey, love matters. And it's nice that you're doing all these religious things, but maybe you shouldn't have forgotten the weightier matters of the law, like mercy and love and justice. And so we forgot it in the Old Testament. We forgot it in the New Testament. And I think sometimes in recent history, the church um, has forgot it. One of the cool things I've, I've been able to, to witness the last four or five years is just the resurgence of churches recognizing that justice and love of neighbor is a necessary component of our faith and that that situates alongside with everything else we're doing. It's not some distant ethical thing for a few very peace corps type um, weirdo people in the church. It's, it's an everyone thing. Does that make sense? And it's been a cool thing to watch that resurgence. But in day-to-day -day practical life, we have to realize that it matters what's happening on this side, just like it matters on this side. That with our tongue, how we talk about the person sitting next to us, how we talk about our spouse, our kids, the person that we work for, is it being seasoned with salt? Is it, is it seeking to reconcile that relationship rather than just blasting it as if it could never be reconciled? We love to play the Holy Spirit's job and judge instead of playing our part, which is to love and to nurture and to seek to grow. And so the thing that helps us with this 
uh, I believe the thing that carries justice that we see is, is this thing called empathy. The ability to recognize in other people their humanity, their dignity, that pain feels painful to them. That, that our lack of love or concern feels hurtful to them. That there's a certain closeness that, that gets brought in that whole relationship. And so one of the things at Kilns College we're all throughout the program we're teaching is this understanding of seeing things from other people's vantage point, like a people's history. That we understand people as individuals, we don't lump them into groups, we don't objectify them, we don't create that distance. That we try to bring them close and near and recognize the image of God in our brothers and our sisters. Um, closeness is an amazing thing. You don't throw a rock like it's somebody close. Like it just, you could hit them, but you, I mean, you don't throw a rock at them. You know, like you have to have distance sometimes to really get angry and throw a stone at somebody. They have to be across the room. When you bring them up close and when you see them like that, it gets a lot harder to throw the stone. Closeness really matters. I've learned this because uh, oftentimes on Sundays, I'll meet, uh, I'll meet a new person in the commons. And uh, usually it's a guy will say something to me like, oh, I thought you were bigger. <laughs> when, when you were talking about sports, I thought maybe you played football, you know, implying like obviously you didn't play football. Because um, distance, this is like the Tom Cruise effect. Like you're looking from below, shooting up, and, and it has this thing of making you think that I'm, so distance can do weird things. Bringing things up close personalizes it. It humanizes it. And so we get this verse about praising the Lord, verse 9, and Father, and with the same tongue we curse men who have been made in God's likeness. People, God's children, our brothers and sisters, the image of God, dignity, potential in everyone, worthy of our love. So I want to bring Mike out here. He's going to do a spoken word piece. Micah, by the way, was one of our interns from Moody um, and sp spent a couple of years with us after he graduated. He just got back from being in India and then Paris. And it's amazing just how God has blessed kind of his spoken word um, ministry and what he's been able to do that way. So Mike is going to come share. Is Micah, there he is. Mike is going to come share something he wrote recently. Um, I, I live down in Long Beach, California, uh, and I have a couple roommates, um, and they're both white guys, and we decided to go to lunch one day, and uh, we went to have lunch at a little local diner, and we had a pretty difficult experience, and that's where this came from. Would you like some more water? Nah, I'm good. That's not what your parole officer said. Did you register when you moved into the neighborhood? couldn't decide if he was a cold racist asking a racist question or a friendly racist telling a racist joke. Either way, I was not amused, but I laughed as the awkward chuckle passed through my lips. It tasted like the Eucharist like blood in my mouth. My stomach churned as I imagined it would if I ate human flesh. I felt like Judas and Christ, betraying myself then hanging in silence as I'm crucified. I wanted to prove him wrong. I wanted to stand up and list off my credentials in words with more syllables than his simple mind could take. I wanted to prove him right. I wanted to stand up and fire off hyphenated profanities, inventing new conjugations for four-letter words like the dumbest nigga he done ever heard. I wanted to prove him wrong. I wanted to leave and come back with the black elite, a fleet of the sharpest, darkest intellectuals he's ever seen, leaving tips large enough to buy out this business twice over. I wanted to prove him right. I wanted to leave and come back with thugs and hood, rats, chains, guns, and bats, burn this place to ash. But what did I do? I laughed, then sat there silently 
then ran home and wrote poetry, then screamed it out like I'm not a coward, like I didn't cry in front of my computer screen, like I wasn't waiting for my two white friends to speak up for me, like I stood up for myself, like I did something, like I fought a revolution, like it wasn't funny, like I didn't laugh. But I did. And it tasted like the Eucharist, like blood in my mouth. And I swallowed it. This organic hole between love of God and love of others, Jesus hung on the cross and died for our sins and for sinners we think are less deserving than us and showed us that we both matter. Showed us that the, the lines we try to draw where God and us are on one side and the people we don't like or the people that have messed up their lives or the people that have made bad decisions or can't seem to make good decisions are somehow on the, the other side of the line. And when Jesus hung on that cross and forgave a sinner, he showed us that he dove to the bottom of the pile to die for all of us as his act of worship, as his calling and his mission, as the thing that shows us it all flows together in that love. He also took a symbol in the Old Testament. And God's a symbolic God, I think, because he knows that art goes deeper in us than anything else. And he wants truth to go deep in us. And God, who created the symbol that Jesus replaced on the cross, shows us that the symbol pointed to more than just our devotion or us experiencing the grace of God. It had this necessary correlation to our love of neighbor, talked in the Old Testament often along these lines. So let me read. I, I wrote this into my book in a chapter on empathy. So let me just read for you. Deuteronomy 24, 17 through 18. Do not deprive the alien or the fatherless of justice or take the cloak of the widow as a pledge. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt and the Lord redeemed you from there and that is why I command you to do this. Leviticus 19, 33 through 34. When an alien lives with you in your land, a stranger, a foreigner, an immigrant, do not mistreat him. The alien living with you must be treated as one of your native born. Love him as yourself, for you are aliens in Egypt, foreigners, strangers, immigrants. I am the Lord, declares God. Exodus 23, verse 9, do not oppress the alien. You yourselves know how it feels to be aliens because you were aliens in Egypt. You should be able to empathize with the plight of this person because you yourself or your community, your family group, your kinfolk should have experienced that as well. Knew the harshness, the harshness of it, knew the desperation of it, knew the joy of it when you were freed from it. And so there's this interesting thing going on. Let me just read a little, bit, a little bit more. It says, God knows that remembrance of Israel's own past will provide a way to empathize with vulnerable people in their own land. God legislated rules for the nation of Israel to ensure that such vulnerable and dislocated people were treated fairly and had their, had their needs met based on Israel's own empathetic understanding of what it is, to, uh, what it is like to live on the margins of a society. The repeated themes of the above is all about remembrance. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt. Love him as yourself, for you were aliens in Egypt. You yourselves know how it feels to be aliens. Now, a friend once told me that in Jewish culture, not remembering to celebrate Passover is not considered a neutral omission, some small thing. Rather, it is the same as actively forgetting it. And such forgetting is a form of pride. Remembering where the Israelites came from was a way of remembering that it was God who rescued them. Remembrance of God's provision properly produces humility and allows for empathy towards others in similar vulnerable states. Jesus co-ops the Passover and he says, you're now gonna do this in remembrance of me. This wine, this juice is as, as, as if my blood is the thing, uh, the thing that is setting you free, much like the Passover lamb in the Old Testament that brought you out of Egypt set you free. And this, this 
bread now is my body broken, hung on the cross, um, bringing about forgiveness for you. These symbols of God's deliverance are being renewed and reimagined in my life as I am conquering the grave, as I am working forgiveness for you. And so you are coming from death literally to life and you know what sin is like and you know what hopelessness is like and you know what being a slave to sin is like. You know what estrangement from God is like. You know what joyless, lifeless, lackluster Um, with regret living is like, but you've been saved from that. And I want you now to engage this symbolism. And you do it regularly and you do it with all that you have in you. You take it serious because symbolism, religious symbolism matters. Baptism and the Lord's Supper, the two oldest kind of most ingrained in the history of the traditional church symbols for how we connect with what God did for us through the person and work of Jesus Christ. And Jesus is saying these symbols now have been renewed and and they're enlarged for you. And there's something really important here that when we engage in these symbols, we don't think this is just about love of God or experience of God, but this remembrance that produces humility, that reminds us of what salvation really feels like and how great our God is and how amazing his grace, it causes us to look at others differently. Those that are hopeless, those that are depressed, those that are slaves to sin, those that are on the margins of society, those that don't have the same families or networks to always bail them out, to always take care of us, that those people are experiencing the pain that we should identify with when we take communion and that they matter, that Christ died for them as well, that we somehow are Christ's ambassadors, we're witnesses, we're ones that are able to go out with this good news to share that gospel, to help people find this forgiveness, to find the lordship, the savior, the one that we follow, the shepherd that'll take care of us, Psalm 23 with all that beautiful language, that we go out and don't judge because they don't have yet what we experience we go out with empathy draw them close and care enough that they would likewise be able to meet our savior that they would see our savior in our love and concern for them that we would be witnesses not just with our words but with how we live our life and how we care and how we see them because they have dignity they're made in the image of God they're our brothers and sisters so what we do when we take communion is this huge unifying exercise that pulls in our taste and our smell and our corporate kind of body language and engagement and walking and it's kinetic and it takes our minds and it takes the symbolic parts and our intuition and it takes that, it takes our, our, our remembrance of ourselves or our family or the history of the church or the history of the human race and it takes our minds and points forward that this is somehow a stopgap promising that Jesus will finally make it all new. That we won't be looking back, but we're also hoping forward that all of these things are sucked into this act of taking communion. And this this freshwater, saltwater thing that we battle with in the church, in this act of symbolism, is stirred together and it cannot exist. The false dichotomy cannot exist. And we walk away touched by the grace of God, renewed in our imagination by the love of God, encouraged that It is God's strength that all this rests on. Not my perfection, not my wonderful loving abilities that I have in spades, but that God cares about me, is renewing me, is sanctifying me through the power of the Holy Spirit, and that I can keep coming to this cross. No matter how imperfectly I live it out, I can keep coming to this cross and receiving the same forgiveness that other people can uh, receive as well. It's, It's beautiful. And so... We're going to take communion in just a minute. Um, On the insides here is normal bread. On the outside is gluten-free. In the back, it's all normal bread. And you can come down. You can pray for a while. You can offer bread to someone with you. You can take it yourself. You can just skip if you'd like to and sit in meditation and prayer. That's okay. This is not something that you're forced into. 
This is an opportunity provided for us. This is something God dreamed up that this symbolism would somehow awkwardly force us back to a position of truth, understanding, humility. So I'm going to read these words from St. Paul in the book of 1 Corinthians. And then the worship team is going to, is going to just keep playing uh, as we reflect and then participate as a, as a community in this thing called communion. This is what Paul says, chapter 11 of 1 Corinthians. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Now do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. Um, Take the bread. You can dip it. There's wine and there's juice. Father, we commit all things back to you. All things are from, through, and to you. To you be the glory. It's not our perfection. It's not how good we are in any of this that's worth celebrating. It's your grace that's worth celebrating that we get to participate in. Let us keep our eyes fixed on you this morning. Let that somehow transform how we keep our eyes fixed on you this week and how that translates into how we live our lives in community in this town, in this place. We pray that in Jesus' name.